Thanks for doing this interview. It's great. Very early in your career, you started a theater yeah. called the Centaur. Why? I wanted to live in Montreal. I'd arrived there three years previously to teach the National Theatre School, not knowing before that really where Montreal was. But I'd got this invitation, and there was a girl in the company in England who said, it's a grand place, you'll really enjoy it. So two weeks later, I got on a plane, came to Montreal, and taught for three years at the theatre school. And it was not difficult, National Theatre School. National theater school. It was not difficult to fall in love with Montreal. It was the World Fair. I had a salary. The girls were sensational. The world had come to Montreal in its abundance. And so I wanted to stay in. And, but there was no English theatre there to employ me. And I lucked into that year. 69, when right across the country there was a, a surge of establishments. Canadian government was putting its money into work projects for young people, etc., and buildings and everything. And in that exact year, the year that year, Canadian plays in Toronto, original Canadian plays went from two to 101 or something in that one year, in that transition year. It was a remarkable year. And of course, that decade was remarkable because uh, in that decade we had Stratford, we had the National Theatre School, the Canada Council, the National Film Board. That was the 60s. So, hey, I couldn't have timed it better. But did you ever see yourself as, as starting a theatre when you started in your career? Well, I had done something like that in England a little bit. I'd run a theatre in Chester for a year as an artistic director, not as a manager, though. And, um, you know, whatever gives me happy employment. And I liked the variety of tasks that I, I knew would follow. I liked the variety. I, I was trained rather minimally as an actor, and I doubted whether I could make my career as an actor or as a director purely, although I liked doing both. But I thought I needed that happy mix. And,. Uh, yeah, so the opportunity of running a theatre uh, seemed to open up all those avenues to me. So how did you do it? How did you start a theatre? There was an, a lunch hour theatre in Montreal called the Instant Theatre, uh, Place for Marie, who was seeking to replace its then artistic director, and they, I'd met the person through the offices of uh, Jean Roberts, one of the great leaders of the Canada Council Theatre Department that this country has had. I don't know where she is now, but God bless you, Jean, wherever you are. She introduced me to Herb Auerbach, who was the chairman of that, the board then, and uh, he immediately sort of thought I would be a possible candidate. So we made this deal that I would take over the lunch hour operation if they helped me start an evening operation, a proper theater company. And they bought into that idea. Herb will buy into the grandest of ideas. He's a real entrepreneur. and. Uh, so we, I ran the, the lunch hour operation for about six months, during which time we found the old Stock Exchange building, which had already been transformed in some measure by a previous group that had then failed. And uh, we inherited that building. And Herb and uh, Peter Duffield were the two board members that saw to that uh, takeover. And I had to go and help raise money I was introduced to the idea of Canadian democracy <laughs> very quickly. I'll tell you how. Uh, there was a gentleman who was running one of the newspapers who uh, had given some money to the previous efforts to transform that building. Do you I found the name of the previous efforts of the Centaur? Well, Jacques Longuiron, who had opened it up as saint Cochereel de Vieux Montréal, a grand vision which would embrace a nightclub and a bar and two theatres. And he had tried to play off both governments, the Quebec government and the, and the federal government, against each other, 
who would be more anxious to fund his operation? <laughs> and of course, they both told him to go get stuffed. <laughs> so he closed it down and many little companies uh, fell at the same time. He had run up debts all over the place. So I'd gone to this guy and he was running the newspaper and I said, he said, why should I put more money into this operation? I said, because you could redeem those funds if we are now successful. You know, they will mean something. And I spent a day there in his office explaining my dream. And each hour he would bring somebody new from one of the newspaper departments to come and listen to my story. And at each time the grant got bigger, but it started at 1,000. It got to 10,000 by the end of the day. Oh, I thought that's a, you know, it's a day's work. And uh, I left him there and I found out a week later that he had taken that idea to the committee and it had been voted down. But Peter Duffield's wife, I think it was, had a family connection to the same trust and they got 40,000 a month later from that same trust. So there were two lessons to be learned there that Canadian society and democracy meant that you could speak to anybody. You could access anybody. It was an open society in that respect. But it didn't hurt to have family connections. Protectia, a lovely old word, you know. Protectia? Protectia. Protectia. It means you know somebody on the inside. Is that a Russian word? No, it's an old Yiddish word. Protectia. Protectia. <laughs> so can you start a theater without protection? Well, at that time you couldn't. There wasn't that much uh, national funding. But it, the, the system at the Canada Council was then you had to prove yourself over one year. At least you had enough durability. So we opened small. We occupied one small part of the theater, which had a stage left on it, a set left on it, uh, Fortune in Men's Eyes, which they had imported from Toronto to open their theater. And they had played, and I'd seen the performance, and then the set was left, the set was left on the stage, but they had done a lot to transform that part of the building. The, the stock exchange had two floors, a Canadian and a Montreal floor. And you got the stock exchange building from the city of Montreal? No, from a, an Italian company that had bought the stock exchange so as to persuade the stock exchange to move into Place Victoria, where the present stock exchange resides. And they owned the building, and they lent it to us on a. Th they, 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 they what? Uh, on a three-month lease, leased it to us on a three-month lease, and we survived five years on a three-month lease. Very harrowing. People would come in to survey this premise that could possibly be turned into a dance hall or multi-cineplex combination. We would so and tell them how. Uh, infested the place was with rodents and this and that and the other. Uh, but we survived five years and then we bought the building with another help from a lot of friends and, uh, and we built the second stage. So we now had two theatres. How long did it take before you knew that the Centaur in fact had, had its roots in the community? About a year and a half. We started very energetically to, to uh, built up a subscriber base and we got about 2,000 or 1,500 in the first year. And so we knew we were on to something. There was a real hunger for English theatre then. There was a million Anglophone in Montreal. It was a, a big mix and they were, many of them, very well endowed. Uh, big middle class of English. Did you know there was a need? Uh, did you know there was a hunger for theatre? Yeah, theater? actually I guess there was because I'd been to a couple of little shows during my years at the theatre school uh, and the English shows had been very well attended. There was, there was, a, uh, there was a hunger as far as I could see. And, so uh, why was no one else doing it? Why did it take Morris Bogby from South Africa of a Lithuanian father who was born in South Africa who came through Britain, who came to Montreal like the girls and wanted to stay. Why, why didn't someone else do it? Mr. Thompson of the Passmorei fame. Paul Thompson. Paul Thompson. Said to me, the reason that I had been successful is because I came from abroad. I said, I'm quite offended by that. Uh, no, I came because I threw myself into it, 100% into the donation. But then I thought there was, a, there was an element of truth in what he said. 
because the new theatres that were being established right across the country were appointing artistic directors from Britain in the English rep mould. That was their image of theatre. That's all they knew, the boards of directors. That was theatre. It was a British repertory pattern with British directors. <laughs> so uh, that may have played a sort of psychological fact, in, but we hustled. We were, all three of us, uh, Peter, Herb and I, we, we, we fought battles every day to keep open. We had the, the Sulpicia. So, sorry, P Peter was the... Peter Duffield, Herb Auerbach. He was the, your board chair? No, he, he was on the board. Herb was the chairman. Herb? Auerbach. 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 He was the board chair. The board chairman. Peter was the money man. Herb was the architect who looked after all the aspects of, a, of, of the city and all, the, all that business. And the negotiations with the Sulpicians who backed onto our theatre from behind the uh, Notre Dame Church backs onto the theater, and we needed rights of egress from them, and he negotiated that. We nearly lost that one year because some actresses were sporting themselves on the back steps while certain figures in long gowns were walking their rounds and binding with the briars. Backs onto the gardens of... Mm, backs onto the gardens of the Sulpician Church. And uh, anyway, we survived all of that, and, uh, and, and uh, yeah. What I want to ask then is, if a young artist or you know, a, a young person walked in here and said, Morris, how do I start a theatre, what would you say to them? Well, you have to, there has to be a place where a theatre is needed, you know, location, location, location. There has to be a theatre, a city, a place, a, an environment, a suburb, somewhere where there is a an obvious need or you think there's an obvious need for a theatre, that's one, and then and then you just got to get stuck into it. There's in no other way. Money in terms of artistic vision, in terms of yeah, you staff, need all, in terms of... Yeah, you need all of that. I was very fortunate in staff-wise. I found a nucleus of people. Uh, my wife Elsa helped me a lot in the first few years. Uh, Judy Cutler came on in January, I think and uh, helped enormously. I built up a PR marketing department and, and uh, so I had a very good nucleus of people to help to work there and, uh, and Jean Roberts kicked in with money in the second year, Canada Council did, and the subscribers were there. So it was proof that my dream, my, my guess had been valid. Uh, but. But yeah, we had to make all of that work on a daily, you know, on a daily... Uh, well, the small theatre, we, we didn't have enough seats. We used to borrow chairs from the restaurant across the road on a Saturday and return them on the Monday morning. Peter Duffield would lend us money on the Friday uh, to pay wages and we'd repay him on the Monday from the weekend takes. So those sort of things uh, were necessary in the first couple of years. And what was your basic staff? Did you have a general manager? No, we had an administrator. I didn't believe in general managers. Why didn't you believe in general managers? I still have my doubts about them. Why? I'm one who firmly believes that the theatre should be run by one person, the artist director, served by the general manager. I don't believe in dual responsibility, although the, the general manager must have access to the board of directors and they to him. It should be an open house in that respect. Everything should be absolutely transparent, but there should be one vision. And general managers are, are incipiently, are, 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 are by definition, dangerous in that respect. Because they have a different vision? No, because they eventually want to, 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 to interfere with the artistic process. Why? Because their numbers, their, their, their figures dictate sometimes more caution or, or uh, yeah, disagreement. So, but isn't that the dilemma in any theatre? Uh, that's what we want to do artistically, but to be financially responsible. Absolutely. We have to go here, so how are those two halves? Well, the artistic director has got to be financially responsible and take the advice, consider the advice of his chief administrator, absolutely. And the board have got to have their say about it too. But then the artistic director has got to make up his, her mind. And, and, and that's the person who's got to lead the theatre. And the vision of the theatre has got to infiltrate into every aspect of that organization.